there's a story that I was sort of sick of by now, but you're not <laughs> sick of it, that she started as a Hooters waitress, and look how far she's come, and you know, typical story. Um, Let's see how many times we can say Hooters in a sentence <laughs> and get people really excited. But it is, it is critical yeah. to your career and your trajectory because you, you say there are these characteristics that transcend industries and job titles, and you talk about confidence, courage, being confident, courageous, and also being humble at the same time. Yeah. Where did those lessons come from? How are you using them in the new role? You know, I think the, the, the key learning I've had over many years is the common denominator between successful leaders, entrepreneurs, leaders of families, is this balance of courage and confidence on one side and humility and curiosity on the other side. And any time I've ever over-indexed too much on one or the other, I have not had optimal results. And I learned that from watching my mom raising three young girls on her own, feeding us on a food budget of $10 a week for three years. Incredible. And so you got to have like a big set of ovaries to go out and do that. Um, so a lot of courage and a lot of confidence. But you also have to have a degree of, of humility and curiosity to learn and find your way. And so I saw that from my mom. That's one place that I learned it. And the other was opening restaurants around the world. When I was 19 and 20 years old, I was... I'd show up in Australia or South America or uh, Asia, and I had to do the same job every time. I had to open a successful franchise, launch the franchise, launch the brands that not only had it never existed in that country, but the word Hooters does not translate into any language. So <laughs> you're literally it redefining the brand. And, uh, but you have to do that with a different team every time. They've yeah. never met you. They don't know you. You have to earn trust over and over and over again. And the times where my teams performed the best were the times that I was really well balanced in humility and curiosity about their culture and their approach, but also had the confidence to make really tough calls in the moment. And so she's learned this key lesson, which is you don't want to be too humble. Because when you're too humble and you think that people sort of ahead of you in the organization know everything and they got it right, then you make a misstep. So she does some pretty unconventional things, like digging <laughs> through the trash, literally, yeah, <laughs> and hiding in bathroom stalls. Yes, I dig through garbage and hide in toilets. Um, so the, it, that's really about a, a true desire to know the truth, the true truth, not having your own filter around what you believe is true about your business or your career or how you're perceived, but actually having the humility to believe there's always more you don't know. And so when I was teaching workshops, bless you, uh, and classes um, all across the world, I didn't always know the people I was working with. And so I would hang out in the women's restroom stall an extra amount of time so that I could hear what was really being said. Um, I only use the information for good and not evil. <laughs> um, but I, I really wanted to know, how did they feel about it? What were their ideas? Were there things that were distracting or annoying them or things that they loved that I needed to dig deeper in? And of course, I didn't have that benefit of hanging out in the men's restroom, um, but at least I got insights that were the real truth. And then I could come back and miraculously shift the experience to be aligned with what they really wanted. And so it was an early example of me wanting the truth. And then digging through the trash is, it's literal in the food business. You want to know what's being wasted. You want to know what the consumer is purchasing that they don't value. You want to know what you're spending money on in terms of inventory and resources that's not delivering a product that adds value. But you can do that in any business that's not a physical business or a direct-to-consumer business. It's about being humble enough to believe you're never always hitting on all cylinders. And with the dynamic nature of the marketplace, there's always a shift in, in the value equation. And so having this muscle to constantly research and see seek the truth as the consumer or the employee experiences it is really driven by confidence that you can do something about it when you figure it out, but humility to know you're, you're never getting it completely right. So Kat answers every single tweet, which is remarkable, uh, and a deal that they just made came because someone tweeted her. So why don't you tell me about this deal with the mother-daughter company gluten-free product, first gluten-free product, and you decided to go with them over a, a big conglomerate. Why? Yeah, we, we've been working on gluten-free products for quite some time, and when you're famous for super soft, ooey-gooey, overly <laughs> indulgent products, it's really hard to make gluten-free super amazing and have it scalable in the supply chain that you need to get it across the world. Um, and, and so we have our own R&D initiatives, but I got this tweet from a woman named Tracy, and she just said, hey, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm in the food business, I'd really love your, your help. 
And so I tweeted her back and said, yeah, I'd be happy to have a phone call and answer some questions. So we literally just got on the phone. It turns out she had just been on Shark Tank. Uh, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, uh, invested in them. And she's like, we have a little bit of energy. We have, some, we have a fast growing business, but I want to be a billion dollar brand. And yeah. Cinnabon is at about a billion five in uh, total product revenue. And we built that pretty quickly in the, in the last five years. And she said, you're my idol and this business is my aspiration. And so I just gave her some feedback on branding and co-branding and scaling and employees and thinking about the marketplace in a logical sequence. And then as we talked, I said, you know, it would be really cool to do a partnership together. It's not going to be a big deal for us. You're so tiny. You're direct to consumer e-commerce. Um, but it'd be a big deal for you to have the Cinnabon brand and ingredients attached to your product. And who knows? Maybe we'll do something so great that it will scale and then it will be a big deal for us. And so we just announced yesterday that this small startup mother-daughter team uh, who has this teeny little business that took all these risks that we launched a global partnership with them and wicked have four products. Cupcakes. Wicked Good Cupcakes. So it's you pretty can order them wicked online. Wicked Good name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Including a gluten-free cupcake. So Kat has had this sort of remarkable trajectory. At the same time, I, I would argue from, from my vantage point, you're facing potentially the biggest hurdle right now, and that is the uh, American and global backlash towards indulgent, quote unquote, fast food. The typical yeah. Cinnabon, uh, over 800 calories. You've got 70% of American adults who are obese, yeah. overweight, a third of American children. You're facing this head on. You're not no running away from it. You're not putting your PR people in front of it. No way. What are you doing? You know, part of it is when you, when you run a business that is an indulgent business, you've just got to be honest about what you are. We're an indulgence. And when I say a classic cinnamon roll, which is for Cinnabon, a pastry the size of your face, <laughs> is 880 calories, most people go, oh, I thought it was 2,000. That's fantastic. <laughs> and, <laughs> but... You know, we, I, I think the, the strategy is when you face headwinds that literally fly in the face of the core of your business, you've got to make some key strategic decisions. And one is, are you going to pivot or are you going to reroute? Um, and we chose to reroute. And we chose to reroute in being authentic to who we are. So that also means you make decisions on what you don't do, that we're not going to add artificial ingredients. When I joined the company, there was an initiative called Project 599. And it was the initiative to get the classic cinnamon roll from 880 calories down to 600. Noble reduction in calories, but nonetheless, I'm not going to go rushing to a counter for a 600 calorie <laughs> dessert any more frequently than I will an 800 calorie dessert. And so the team, one of the things I learned is the work became about the work. They became obsessed with the interim goal as opposed to what will actually get more frequency and reduce the veto vote and get more trial. And the reality was we already had a smaller portion that was 320 calories, this cutie patootie little mini bon, and we just hadn't scaled it globally. We hadn't mandated it. And so we said, here's what we're going to do as, as trends change. We're going to stay true to high quality ingredients. We're going to roll and make and bake all of our products in store. But we are going to launch a broader variety of portion sizes in a way that gives people more permission to indulge. And then we're going to be super honest about who we are. When I go on national television or do global interviews, I say, we are an indulgence. There is tons of good sugar and good fat in that stuff. And don't eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But my view is we all give ourselves discretionary calories. But I know, I don't know about all of you, but if I'm going to invest my discretionary calories, like my discretionary income, it had better be so freaking worth it. It had better be so disturbingly delicious. And so there needs to be a high return on that indulgence. And so our key is just killer quality, honesty and authenticity in, in who we are, providing a much broader variety of portion size and pricing variety so that we democratize access to sweet treats, mm -hmm. but don't just go at it in this one bull in a china shop way. And for the last five years, the brand has had the highest year over year comp sales in all of the snack category. We've tripled the EBITDA over the last five years, and the brand has scaled to 68 countries. Um, and so the strategy is working, despite yeah. the fact that the trends are what they are. Right, despite the headlines. Yeah. Um, another thing that I really would like to open it up for questions is um, the other uh, challenge you're facing right now is the fight for 15. Yeah. Um, you, you now oversee all of these fast food uh, brands. And um, 
look, this is in our face. In New York City, totally. where I am, it is across the board. Yeah. Change is coming. What the number is going to be, who knows? Kat and I yeah. sat down for a long interview in Washington, D.C. a few months ago, and I was so struck by your answer. Um, you want to be talking about this. Absolutely. You're glad that we're talking about it, and you don't think 15 is the answer immediately, but you also don't think the current state is the answer. No. And, and I'll tell you, it's been interesting since that interview aired. I've had some people from the, the restaurant industry say, wait a minute, you're like advocating for $15 an hour. And I said, no, that's actually that's not, not what, what I said. said. And I didn't edit it that way. <laughs> no, I actually said the answer is not $15 right. an hour today. Uh, but the answer is not staying where we are. And, right. and so there are three considerations that I hope continue to be brought forward in the media, but less importantly in the media and more importantly in policymaking. And one is that small businesses are facing a ton of margin compression. Um, real estate cost increase, food cost fluctuations, global headwinds around consumer confidence and discretionary income. And so all of those things are putting pressure on these little tiny businesses. And so if you go to $15 an hour tomorrow, for sure, there is only so much you will pay for a pretzel or a burrito or a cinnamon roll. And, and there will be a lot of businesses that start making bad short-term decisions if we were to go there right away. And so we need to understand the dynamics of franchisees and small businesses and what those P&Ls actually look like and have a national conversation about the business and what it can sustain, but society and what it needs. And I don't believe there are the right stakeholders at the policymaking table right now, and it's become a very polarized, politicized issue. So the first bucket is consider small business and what that impact actually is. The second is when you're a national chain or a business, it's really hard to budget and plan for your business when you have no idea what the wages are going to be in Nashville, Tennessee versus Seattle, Washington versus New York City. And so the fact that we don't have a scaled approach where we can be planful makes it just very difficult to be a larger business. So we also spoke a little bit about politics. Yes. Uh, you, are, you are a supporter of Hillary Clinton. Yes. Um, and I walked out of our interview feeling like one day Kat Cole might run for office. <laughs> My answer is always, I want to have the greatest impact on the world and the highest return on my effort. And if that's spending time with my friends and family, that's what it is. If it's philanthropic work in Africa that I spend a lot of time doing, that's what it is. The work you've done recently in Baltimore in the Absolutely. wake of the protests. Yep, doing, uh, going and doing impact eventing in cities that are in transition to both learn from those communities and contribute to those communities. And a big part of making an impact is running a responsible, thoughtful, conscious, creative, connected capitalist business. And, and that is how I make impact on the world today. And I believe that doing all those things helps shape politics and shape policy. But I've learned to say, you never know. Question. Anyone, anyone in the audience? Any questions? OK, I have a final question for you. Um, when you look at what you've achieved so far, you've said, I've learned to question success a lot more than failure. We often hear, I learned so much from my failures. When have you questioned your success? Yeah, I, I learned this actually from running restaurants. Um, I remember that I was an assistant manager in one of the Hooters restaurants. And we had a general manager that was not a fantastic human being. She was very difficult to work with, did not inspire followership. But the sales in this restaurant were up year over year over year. And I saw the corporate office and the regional manager celebrating and glamorizing this business. And they said, wow, the sales are up. What an awesome general manager. And I thought, <laughs> if you knew what I knew, she's not amazing. And the reality was there were other forces creating the economic success. There was construction happening all around that restaurant. So we had construction workers and visitors and businesses. And the minute that building stopped, the sales tanked. And all of a sudden, she was no longer the hero. And I witnessed firsthand that it is so dangerous not to get it right, what you think are the drivers of success. Because then you start duplicating unproductive behaviors. And you start celebrating things that actually aren't driving success. So the key is when you do have success, when you see big sales growth, when you win a client, um, when you have some type of a win, is to actually challenge yourself and others to beat that up and say, what, what were the drivers of this success? And if you get it right, you can duplicate those behaviors. And if you get it wrong, you will realize probably pretty quickly through the investment of unproductive resources that, that you haven't gotten it right. And I see too many people focusing on just failures. Of course, we learn a ton from failures. But the issue with failures is essentially that the lessons are clear. The problem with success is that you don't question it. And so if you build the muscle of saying, why was this successful, being thoughtful about that, you will be more successful more frequently over time as a result. It's a great lesson, Kat Cole. Thank you very much. My pleasure.